walk this path, see, and others, some are arriving at a place, and others of us, we're at different places in our journey. I just love that about our relationship with the Lord, because when we're in the supermarket, or whether we're at, at home, or, or wherever we're at, whomever we encounter, we may know that they're a believer, we may not know. We don't know when we might be speaking to an unbeliever or to a believer. I've always... I've uh, been careful to say, when we witness to the lost, we don't always know who the lost are, do we? And so I wanted to kind of work through a series, and this is just the launching of this new series of the unbeliever, believer questions. Now I've, give, I've given you some uh, opportunity to, to send me your questions through Facebook, and, and even I've talked about it here. And you've been sending me these questions, so thank you for all these unbeliever, I mean believer questions. I know you believe it. And you've been sending me believer questions. You've been sending me unbeliever questions too because they're questions maybe that you've heard. Questions that have been asked of you. And so I've taken these uh, unbeliever questions and these believer questions. And sometimes they're the same, but oftentimes they're in different places because we're in different parts of our journey. And I've taken two questions, from each, one from each side, and put them together. And today I want to talk to you about two questions that uh, were asked so far. So I begin with this. Simply, uh, the unbeliever is saying, why is there free will? Why does God allow all of the terrible things ha to happen in this world? Why doesn't he just take it all out? Why does he have to let man have a choice? I think of that as an unbeliever question. Sometimes believers might think it, but there are many Christians, and I trust all Christians, would say, okay, I get it, I want Jesus, I make my choice, now Lord, what is your will for my life? So we go from the uh, question of choice to a question of, Lord, I get it, what is your choice for me? What is your will for me? So let's work through that, and I want to begin in Genesis chapter 2. I immediately started thinking about the two trees in the garden. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So I want to read this passage, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. So you're looking at me. How come you're not looking at your Bible? Okay, you are. Okay. All right, and I know the scriptures are up there. But if you would like, there's Bibles in your seats, and you can pull that out. I don't know about you. Sometimes when I'm holding my Bible, I get a little more conviction. Or it becomes a little more personal. And, uh, and so it, I would encourage you to pull out the Bible right there in your seat. But let's read together verses 8 and 9, not a long passage, but here in chapter 2. It says this, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of of good and evil. Let's pray again together. Heavenly Father, I would ask this morning that you would just open our eyes to this passage. Lord, when your word is presented to us, if it's void of the Spirit, then it falls on deaf ears, and we want to have uh, open ears to hear, open eyes to see your word. Help us with that today, and help our pastor too. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So why did God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden in the first place. Why? Why did he do that? If he had just not done that, right? Things, things might be better. But would they? But would they? Why did God create free will? We go all the way back to Lucifer in the heavens when he chose to rebel against God. We, we go all the way back there, don't we? Believer says, I've settled that in my heart, though. But I'm really struggling, Pastor. I'm struggling with what is God's will for my life. I can't seem to find my purpose in life. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. How does your will, Lord, mesh with the desires that you've given me in life? Why do I want the things that I want? I think that's an awesome question for a believer to ask. To, to say, this is how I think, this is how I, uh, I, I, I 
play out life. We watch our two uh, grandsons, our twin grandsons, six months old. I didn't realize it. Six months old on my birthday. It's kind of cool now. So, so I got these grandson twins in my home for a time. For a time. And, yeah, pray. Yeah. For a time. And these two grandsons, I, I look at Trey and Tatum, and I see Trey. You guys have seen him. Many of you who have been around him. Beaming from ear to ear. Just can't stop smiling. He's Mr. Socialite. And then, then there's Tatum. And then, you know, Tatum's going to do my taxes someday. <laughs> See? And he's going to be my accountant. And he's going to straighten out my retirement funds. And, and, but Trey's going to be leading the party, you see. We all have different ways of looking at life, don't we? And so, and so we ask, what is the Lord's will for my life? Now, these are the kinds of questions that I'm going to ask over these next few weeks. So keep, keep funneling them to me, and I'll even be provoking you on Facebook on Monday and Tuesday to help me for the next week, okay? So just watch Facebook on our church page, and you can help me out. You can write my sermons for me. How about that? Yeah. Have an amen? Amen. Okay, good. <laughs> but here's a concern I have. Don't you agree that we as believers sometimes get so focused on godly subjects that we forget to connect with people who might be further back in their formation of God. And, and why he did what he did in creation, what he did in the history of the church, sometimes the good, bad, the indifferent that we see in the history of the church, what he's doing now in our needy world, and what he's preparing to do for our future in eternity in heaven. I know that's a whole mouthful. And I got something in my mouth. I don't know what it is, but I just got rid of it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. You see, when we put it that way, a floods of questions begin to come. But what kinds of questions? And so we we have these questions as believers. And we know that unbelievers have questions. You see, we begin in the Garden of Eden, in our passage a moment ago, we read that there's not one tree, but two. So in essence, there is not one question, but two questions. Is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil a tree of unbelief, and the tree of life of belief? One would think so, but what about the third tree in the Garden of Eden? Did you see it? Did you see the third tree in the Garden of Eden? It says, and the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. So it wasn't just two trees, two trees that were important to remember. But what about these third group of trees now? Certainly these trees had something to do with meeting the needs of mankind. God knows how to take care of us, to provide for us, to bring fruit. I don't know if you noticed, but in our new backyard, there are two apple trees. You may also notice that the branches are growing so low to the ground that I haven't had time to make it a priority to prune those trees up. Maybe in future years we'll have better apples. I know that takes some work. I know the Gross family has had an apple orchard, and if you don't maintain it, it doesn't give you fruit like you want. But trees help us, don't they? they it's something of provision from God. One could even argue that all three trees, so to speak, were necessary for us to come to the place where we are today. Yesterday we had a, a pre-wombat bike ride here in Port Huron. We hosted one. Some of our riders came from different parts of the state. I think there was uh, seven of our riders and then some of our team gathered over at the house to kind of bless us with food after the ride, and, and we had a great time, but while we were on that ride, we noticed that there were also motorists on the byway, right? On the highway. And, and sure enough, the seven of us were in tandem uh, drafting and having fun riding through uh, Beards Hills. I didn't tell the team that that's also called Dead Man's Hills until after they rode that ride. But, but as we were riding through those hills, all of a sudden, here comes one of those cars. They feel the need to honk. And it was a honk in such a way it says, if you don't get out of my way, I'll show you this is your last day, you know. 
And so they were moving on by the time they honked, and we could just tell it was an attitude honk. And, I, and we always agree as cyclists, there's always one more that has to talk with their horn when they're passing us. You know, wherever people are at in their walk with God or their motoring habits on the road, there are challenges around us. I'm not saying that that person was an unbeliever, although the thought crossed my mind at that moment. But unbelievers ask this question, why did God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? They want to know why God in an equal fashion didn't do anything to intervene for the police officers who were gunned down this week at what I understand was a peaceful rally to bring hope and to bring Help. But they found themselves in harm's way, didn't they? Why doesn't God simply stop evil from happening in our land? The believer says, I get it. God wants each one of us to make a choice. And therefore, the capacity for evil exists. In this light, the believer wants to know God's will for him or her so that they can make their difference in the world, like a worship team coming to us and just carrying us to a place of great worship. And each one of you have gifts. Each one of you, as believers, have gifts that bless us, whether it's our instruments or whether it's serving throughout the church. We all have gifts that we bring. We, we, we just add to the good that God wants to bring out in us as believers so in light of this, let's simply begin to talk about what we need to know about God. So what we need to know about God. And I've got some helps in your notes. If you like to take notes, this is that point. You can pull that out. First of all, what we need to know about God is that God made us in His image. I'm sure you've heard this before. If not, maybe that's good news to you. God has made you in His image. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God has created you and me in His image. We are like God. Okay, we are not God, right? But don't miss it. We are like God. God's imprint is on our life. That's just amazing news. It's, it's amazing to, even as I studied that this week, I was just sitting back and and my chair just going, I don't know about if you know this, but I get all teary-eyed in my office. This isn't the only place I cry. Uh, and I get all teary-eyed because that truth should just hit us and say, his imprint is, is, is right here in me, in you. He made, us, he made us in his image. Isn't it equally compelling when our children are born and as they grow up, in the same way they take on our likeness, don't they? In the same way. We begin with this thought, God wants, uh, God wants there to be more than one of Him. There's only one God. I, I get it. Don't, don't, don't throw me out yet. But He wants more of Himself and He sees it in you. When you're at your best, He's going, wow, is that... Is that me or them? I mean, isn't that great that God can say, I don't know, Seth and Ellen, it's good to see you today. Uh, they're from a, a neighboring church. It's good to have you with us. When God says, he looks at you, Seth, and he goes, Seth, I don't know if it's you or Jesus that I see. Isn't that a compliment? I mean, that's the kind of image that God wants to have in you and me as he sees us succeed in life. But there's another element here, too. Isn't God taking a risk, creating you and me? 
There's the risk. And, and there's, there's a payoff, and sometimes not. Sometimes there isn't a payoff. Sometimes there's a, a, a Judas that goes out and, and takes his life because he can't handle the pressure of the, the messed up emotions and spiritual uh, diving that went on in his life that caused him to end it all and to never make it to heaven. That's the risk God is willing to take. And that's the more of the unbeliever question, like why? It just seems so stupid. Sorry if that's slang for you. I used it. World religions are formed in rebellion against God. Tragedies seem to be real because of this risk. And there are several reasons for this risk, but it leads to point number two. You see, point two is about God's desires, and then point three about our desires. So let's move on. You see, number two, God chooses to be a God of fellowship. So he's made us in his image, but he's created us for fellowship. Spending time with those who want to be with him. God wants to spend time with us. From the time when Lucifer no longer wanted to be part of God's fellowship, to our choice to accept Christ into our hearts, God desires to be with us. In Genesis 3, I love this, right out of the creation story. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord. The Lord God, as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid, I don't like this part, they hid from God among the trees of the garden. But then we go back to the positive. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? First, God is in the garden walking, so from the start, we see what God desires. He wants to be where we are. He wants to be in his creation. He wants to be there. He certainly leads us to believe this is not a first for God. We get that from some of the story we understand of the heavens and some of the rebellion that's going on. If there's risk that angels could rebel against God at that time, uh, then there's reward. For fellowship with God in that time. If you sometimes do a little bit of the domino theory, you can begin to say, then this must have been going on, and that must have been going on in heaven. And here it is again in creation. So first, he's simply walking among his creation. But second, God is making a pastoral call. He's stopping by one of his parishioners. He's He's stopping by to say, hey, I just wanted to see if you were available for some fellowship. Maybe a round of golf. I don't know what they did in the Garden of Eden at that time, but I sure hope there was a golf course or two. I kind of doubt it. A bowling alley. A bowling alley. Okay. God is certainly a God who desires fellowship. Did you know that as life ticks along, every day, every moment of the day, God is just waiting to see you again. Did you know that? He's looking around every corner. Every time you do something in your life and, and you're just busy, he's going, he's always right, he's like, I can't wait to have another conversation with you. That's God. He desires your fellowship. On my best days, I approach God with the thought, God is waiting for me to come to him and to talk. He's waiting for me. He's waiting for you. But if we stop here, we can easily say that God is kind of a selfish God. He's just kind of wanting all this stuff for himself. And he wants fellowship, but then... Look at number three. It's interesting because God chooses to not only want fellowship, he chooses to be a God of love. Now I jump to the New Testament, and I know I'm taking a big leap from the, the creation story, but there's a wonderful verse that has always captured my heart in the, in the book of Romans. In Romans 5.8, it says, But God demonstrates his own love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were getting it wrong... When we were running from God, when we had 
When we were giving God every reason, there's no need for the cross. God, it's just like, they they're all have turned away. They've all sinned. It's when everyone was turning away from God. That's the moment when Jesus said, I'm going to die on the cross. He did it before we were ever going to respond. God loves us. If we just talked about point one and two, we would, we would say, really, a robot life might be the right choice for God. Then there wouldn't be so much pain. A pastor got up to preach and announced a pastor friend was with them and would just share a short word. So that pastor got up and shared his story. There were, he simply shared this story. He said there were three men in a boat. There was a father and a son and a friend of the son. The, the waves got rough. And as hard as the father tried, he couldn't keep the sailboat uh, upright. And so when the, the sailboat went over, all three of them were thrown into the water and, and the seas were rough. And so the father made it to the capsized vessel, but the two boys were out of the distance and the, the father had one life ring and, and he had to decide which man he was going to throw the life ring to, not knowing if the other would be saved in enough time. He had this decision to make in his mind. He said... He thought to himself, my son is a Christian. He knows the Lord. His friend is an unbeliever. Who do I throw the life ring to? He made the incredibly difficult choice. This pastor shared this story. Threw that life ring to the unbelieving boy. And he saved the boy's life. And he went to throw the life ring to his son. But his son had gone down. Never to be seen again. The pastor sat down after telling that story in the resident pastor came up to finish the service. There were two young teenagers who were in the service that night. Every time the, the pastor uh, was telling his story at that earlier moment, the boy sat up further and further waiting for the end of the story. And, and, and the pastor, uh, when he ended it the way he did, uh, the teenagers kind of slunk back into their seats, seemed disinterested again. After the service was over, the two teenagers came up to the pastor and said, your story was an interesting one, but it was unrealistic, don't you think? To which the pastor visiting simply said, that might be true, but you see, I was the father, and your pastor was that friend. And we begin to say, how much does God really love us? And how much does God's love flow through us to others, like each one of you here. One of the beautiful things I love about the body of Christ is when we minister to each other, when we are throwing lifelines, when we begin to say, uh, Brian, if you keep uh, playing all kinds of music that has nothing to do with the Word of God on your radio station, I think you're on a sinking ship. If, if my brother was doing that, he's not. <laughs> he's not. I love the music on 88.3 and 90.7. But if, if we're throwing lifelines to each other when we're uh, wayward in our ways and we're helping each other, I love the body of Christ that helps each other. And sometimes we get it wrong, don't we? Sometimes we don't always get it right. But we have the opportunity to do just what I'll illustrate in a moment ago. You see, from this story, we see that God chose to do the following. And I finish with these last three thoughts. First of all, he has chosen to love everyone the same. Did that father love his son any less than his friend when he threw that lifeline to his friend? Can you imagine what the son saw when his dad chose to throw that lifeline to his friend, and his son was still above water at the time. And he saw his dad rescue his friend first. Life gets difficult sometimes, but the father loved his son the same. John 3.16 is a wonderful verse that helps us at a time like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall have what? I'm sorry, what did he have? Eternal life. Eternal life. And if you're a King James kid, 
everlasting life, right? He chose to love everyone the same. He has chosen to love everyone with his passion. Secondly, in Zephaniah 3.17 it says, The Lord your God is with you, mighty, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. He no longer, in his love, he no longer rebukes you, but will rejoice over you with singing. God has a passion for you. We've illustrated that a bit earlier, but again, he's got a passion for you. God is pursuing you. Are you responding? Are you responding? And finally, he has chosen to love everyone forever. I've heard sermons preached that God may not love certain people. In fact, in my research this week, I found a couple of uh, uh, illustrations where uh, pastors were, were somehow creating this conditional response by God. I, 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 don't, I don't know about you, but I do not have a bone in my body that believes that God doesn't still deeply love Lucifer and misses him. When we see someone make poor choices and some who uh, are no longer with us. Years ago, I got called back to a previous church to, to do not one, within two years, not one, but two suicide funerals. It broke my heart. It broke my heart. They're before the Lord and their relationship is before Him. I don't know how to answer that question very easily. But we grieve. Our love is no less when life is lost or when a person chooses our way or not. God has chosen to love everyone forever. I was at uh, Heman's about three, four weeks ago, Heman's camp. You know our, our other camp. We have two camps that we support. We were at Heman's camp getting ready. There was about five of us raking leaves, putting leaves in the trailer and and, uh, and I was on the trailer of leaves with Brad Ross. Brian was driving the truck, meandering back through the, the narrow lane to the backfield where we were dumping the leaves. We had dumped the leaves, and I actually had had a, a piece of foam about that deep that uh, for some reason was on the trailer. And so I laid that piece of foam on the trailer, and I just laid on that, uh, on that platform uh, where the leaves were as Brian drove us back for another load. There's no leaves on the trailer. I'm looking straight up into the sky. It's a beautiful blue sky day. And as Brian pulled through the lane, uh, quite a, a, a length, I was looking straight up into the trees. And I wasn't prepared for what I was about to see. Because as, as I was looking up, I saw all the green canopy of, of trees, but then I saw all of the light glistening through the uh, separation between the leaves. And it was, it was like billions of lights because of the contrast of the, of the leaves. I was seeing such a contrast, I was blown away. These glistening rays of sunshine for me reminded me of how present God was with me in that moment. I just laid there. I wanted to take out my phone and just capture it, and I did. But I wanted to capture it because I wanted to keep it. God has chosen you forever. He has a passion for your life, and he loves all of you just the same. I hope that as you understand God's word in the, the three trees from the Garden of Eden, to your relationship with God, that you would know that the tree of life that God gives us is the most amazing statement of God's very best for you. He made you in His image. He's got His imprint on you, and He's providing for you all the trees in the land so that your life could be everything he wants it to be. Friend, you don't have to live in unbelief. Keep asking questions. Keep seeking the Lord. Believers, keep growing in your faith and be ready. Be ready to understand God's word so that it makes sense for you and for your unbelieving friend. Would you pray with me?
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have given us trees to live by. A tough tree to make the right choice. And a tree that would give us life. Oh God, we are so thankful that even if there's an unbeliever among us today, I pray that there would be reason that they would become a believer. And so now, friend, as we pray, would you like to know Christ as your personal Savior? Is it time for your life of unbelief to begin a life of belief? I'm still praying for you right now. Would you come to your maker, the one who has his imprint on your life, and would you like to receive Christ as your Savior and live in that imprint God has already on you? Oh, friend, accept him, confess your sin, and live for him. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand?